Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Sheriff Scott Rose from Minnesota, and I'm your host for today's new episode of the Officer Down Memorial Podcast. He's walking eastbound, walking eastbound. In each episode of the Officer Down Memorial Podcast, we'll share the details and the stories of how these men and women heroically lost their lives in the line of duty. Our mission is to help ensure their service and sacrifice is never forgotten. Thanks for spending some time with me today to remember and honor these fallen heroes. Marion County is located in Ohio and has a population of around 65,000 people. It was created in 1820 and organized in 1824, named for General Francis the Swamp Fox Marion, who was a South Carolina officer in the Revolutionary War. The city of Marion is the county seat. It's home to just over half of the county's population. Marion was one of Ohio's major industrial centers until around the 1970s. Products of the Marion Steam Shovel Company were bought by contractors to help build the Panama Canal, Hoover Dam, and the Holland Tunnel under the Hudson River. NASA had also contracted with them to manufacture the crawl transporters that move the assembled Saturn V rockets used for Project Apollo at the launch pad. One interesting historical note. During the 1800s, Marion served as a stop in the Underground Railroad, known in Ohio as the River to Lake Freedom Trail. The Underground Railroad was a network of secret routes and safe houses established in the U.S. during the early to mid-19th century. It was used by enslaved African Americans to escape into free states and into Canada. Hearings would begin in Iraq this year in the trial of President Saddam Hussein for war crimes and crimes against humanity. The reactions from around the world continue to come in, and especially from within Iraq, Amar al-Hakim, who's a leader of the Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq, said, we want Saddam to get what he deserves. I believe he will be sentenced to hundreds of death sentences at a fair trial because he is responsible for all the massacres and the crimes in Iraq. Amar al-Hakim is a Shiite, and of course the Shiite people suffered great Greatly under his uh, regime. Quick review for those of you just joining us. Saddam Hussein was captured last night. Facebook is launched as a new social networking site, only open to students from Harvard University by Mark Zuckerberg and his college roommates. When we first launched, we were hoping for, you know, maybe 400, 500 people. And now we're at 100,000 people. So who knows where we're going next? <laughs> It's an online directory that connects people through universities and colleges through their social networks there. You sign on, you make a profile about yourself by answering some questions, entering some information such as your concentration or major at school, what books you like, movies, and most importantly, who your friends are. And then you can- By 2021, around. Mark Zuckerberg's net worth was estimated at more than $112 billion. And with over 2.8 billion users and a market value of nearly $850 million, you'd be hard-pressed to find anyone who doesn't know about Facebook. These four years have brought moments I could not foresee and will not forget. I've learned firsthand that ordering Americans into battle is the hardest decision, even when it is right. I have returned the salute of wounded soldiers who say they were just doing their job. I've held the children of the fallen who are told their dad or mom is a hero, but would rather just have their mom or dad. I've met with the parents and wives and husbands who have received a folded flag. And in those military families, I have seen the character of a great nation. Because of your service and sacrifice, we are defeating the terrorists where they live and plan, and you're making America safer. I will never relent in defending America, whatever it takes. 
President George W. Bush beats Democratic challenger John Kerry to gain his second term as President of the United States. The year was 2004. Marion, Ohio was a busy blue-collar community back in 2004. Brian Lovell was a deputy for the Marion County Sheriff's Office. 404 square miles, uh, several villages, about half the population in the city. Now, we have we have villages spread out um, all over the place, and we were primarily responsible for, for those, too. So at that time, there were a lot of bars, um, a lot of activity. You know, this was before, before social media and cell phones, before cell phones or anything, really, when we first started. So we've seen that transition. So before that, people used to actually you know, uh, gather and go out and go to bars. The law enforcement community in this area, in this county, in this part of Ohio, was a very tight-knit group of families. Many law enforcement families in Marion County at that time had multiple family members who served in one capacity or another in their community, including 29-year-old Deputy Brandy Lynn Windfield who came from a family of law enforcement. Now, I met Brandy. He joined our Explorer post at the sheriff's office when he was 14. And um, when I joined the Explorers, you had to be 16. But somewhere between my time and his, they lowered the age and you could join it at 14. So he he joined it. And I, I always I told this story uh, a few times. I <laughs> When I first met him, I, when I first actually met him, I walked into the sheriff's office one day and he was sitting at this desk mowing on a pizza he was eating this this i don't know this big pizza and he he the kid i mean at that time i don't know what he weighed but i mean i'd say he was you know, he's like six foot tall and 120 pounds you know what <laughs> but uh i walked in there and he was just going to town on his pizza and i looked at him and i said that there is a windfield if i ever did see one <laughs> Because he looked like his dad, you know. But I, I, I mean, I wouldn't say his dad wasn't a big eater. But I mean, he just, he just looked like, and he just kind of looked at me. And I walked in, and I just shook my head, you know. And, and uh, <laughs> you know, I was the old, I was, I was an old season guy at the age of, you know, right from the age at that time of twenty two, I think, or something. I don't know. But so uh, that's when I first met him. And then he, he was, you know, he was around at the office for. He became part of the part of the the furniture at the office for a long time because he really enjoyed it, loved it being there, and he was very active in the Explorer Post, so he was he was in our office all the time and, uh, you know, got to know him real well. Brandy's wife, Sarah, also served as a 911 dispatcher. That's how they met. I was working as a 911 dispatcher in Union County, which is one county south of where Brandy worked at Marion County. He was dispatching at the time, too. He started dispatching when he was 17 years old. Still in high school, he was working midnight and going to school during the day. Another dispatcher from our office was super friendly with everybody and went up to meet the other dispatchers in Marion County that she talked to on the phone all the time and told Brandy, we have this real wild girl down there that you would like. Well, he started paging me in the middle of the night. And I'm like, who is this paging? Why is this guy paging me? And just, we had page net pages at the time and dispatch, you could type full messages. I <laughs> get like, hello from Marion County. And I agreed to meet him on a blind date. So I met him um, at a little bar north of um, Union County. He met. I parked my car there, and we went into town. I wasn't even 21 yet. He took me to a bar. I couldn't drink. I was like, what a weirdo taking me to a bar. And I, I'm not old enough to drink, and we get in trouble. And then I agreed to a second date with him, and he showed up at my best friend's house where I was staying. And he had his pants pulled up to his nipples. And he just looked real goofy. I was <laughs> like, oh, great. So we go out to dinner, and he was eating with his mouth open and, like, ranch dressing was like, getting all over his lips. And then he fell asleep in the movie and was drooling because he worked midnight the night before. And I was never going to go on another date with him. Never. Like, I'm not going on another date with this guy. And my friend sent me out and you are too picky. He seems like a really nice guy. You should go out with him again. So I agreed to it, and he kind of grew on me. It was, he just had this really infectious, great personality, and he was super happy and really into me. So, you know, I moved in with him a month later. He was so infectious and so funny. Um, he called me his little hillbilly girl uh, because I, you know, I grew up, yeah, I grew up in a little tiny town and out in the country and he was a city boy. So it was just, 
an instant connection after I decided to actually give it to him. Brandy's father, brother, and great-grandfather also served in this community. Me and Brandy, and then we had Landon at the time was three and a half, and Tyler was one and a half. Brandy's great-grandfather was a deputy. Yeah, he actually had his great-grandfather's badge and a jacket. And then his brother, he went to Wittenberg University, played baseball, had graduated and got a job as a cop at Marion City, and he was married to Lindsay. And then his dad was a cop at Marion City as well, had over 30 years in when he retired. And then his mom. And his mom did daycare in the community, um, did all the cops, you know, the police officers all brought their kids to uh, Rick and Shirley's house. Matt Bales was the elected sheriff there in 2021 and was with the Marion Police Department back in 2004. They all had the same personality. They were all ornery as all get out. Uh, you know, I, I worked with, with Rick when I, when I first came on the department and then Brandy's brother Corey joined the department and he was on my shift. So I, I was a supervisor and I was actually Rick's supervisor for a while too. You know, Rick was one of the best detectives I ever met. He, he could talk to somebody and, and get them to admit whatever he wanted them to admit. He, he just had that personality that, that people wanted to talk to him. Even as a young explorer, Brandy had quite the sense of humor. Brandy was kind of goofy. He had a, he had a laugh that would make you laugh. And he was just a fun guy to be around and a, you know, a, a fun guy to work with. He, he could make light of a situation and he would find himself in, in scenarios where that would make you laugh. You know, we, we played ball and you know, I, I, I would fill the lineup out and I'd stick him in the in right field. And he'd always want to play the, you know, it, it just would be funny about it. And, and we would laugh and, and, and have a good time. And it was always fun. And he was just, uh, you know, he was good at his job. He was good at his job. So, you know, he just made friends wherever he went. And, and uh, he just had the kind of personality that, you know, I, I, I said before how, how Rick had these relationships in the community and, and Brandy would have had them too. You know, if, if he had been allowed to finish his career, he had the personality that would have enabled him to have those relationships with Rick. It was football season, and the Marion Harding High School was gearing up for another home game coming up Friday night. The school's mascot, the Presidents, which was sometimes shortened to the Prexies, is symbolized by an eagle named Warren G. Named after Marion's most famous son, our 29th President of the United States, Warren G. Harding, who also owned the Marion Star newspaper at the time. Juan Cruz and Luis Hernandez. They were friends from Delaware, Ohio, about 20 miles south of Marion. They had driven up to Marion and had been partying and playing pool at the Sundance Bar at 302 West Center Street in Marion. Juan had been drinking heavily that night, beer and tequila. They had also been smoking marijuana throughout the evening. They left the bar close, and they were headed back to Delaware when Juan decided he wanted Luis to stop at the Motor Mart in Marion. He wanted to go inside and call and talk to the female bartender again from the bar. After making his phone call, the two got back in the van, and they headed south on Highway 423 to Delaware. Luis was driving. A few miles north, outside of the village of Waldo, which is about nine miles south of Marion, they ran out of gas. It was dark, it was the middle of the night, and they were still a long way from Waldo. They decided to walk up to a nearby residence to ask for gas, and they knocked on the door. The homeowner, who wouldn't open the door, said they couldn't help. Juan and Luis went back to the van. They tried to start it again. They did get it started, just enough to get it pulled off the roadway, and then it quit. They got back out, and they headed south towards Waldo when a pickup pulled over. Two older men who were on their way to work stopped and offered them a ride to the gas station in Waldo. The two jumped in the back of the pickup and then got dropped off a few minutes later at the gas station. They went inside. They asked the gas station attendant if they could borrow a gas can and purchase gas. Luis paid for $2 in gas and they walked out and they started walking back towards their van. 
Luis is carrying the gas can and was walking faster than Juan. He wanted to get back to the van. Juan, who was extremely intoxicated, had a hard time keeping up with Luis, and he fell behind. Lee Blair was the sergeant on duty that night. We always took, we always assigned areas. And that night, Russ Rigney was my east unit, Brandy was my west unit, and I took south because we have more calls south than we do north. So I went south, and I we'd done our patrol that night. And I, I, know, I don't think we had anything, nothing else from that night really stands out. I know we had a few calls and this and that, but I had court that day scheduled at like 9 or 9.30. So I was going to come in and go home early and try to get some sleep before I had court. So I was going to leave at, I think, 4.30. Because we would have been uh, 11P to 7A would have been our normal shift. So, and I remember, and it's strange, I remember I came up 423 that night, shortly before I went into the office to secure for the night. And I checked, uh, we got a car dealership on the south side of town, a Dodge dealership. And I drove around the dealership because we were having a rash of, they were going in like stealing, putting the trucks up on blocks and actually stealing the rims and tires. So I went around that dealership and I remember... It's strange because when I saw the van later, it triggered the memory. When I went around the north side of that and come, started coming around the north side of the building, I saw that van go by because it had really loud exhaust. And, you know, if it hadn't been one of them, if I hadn't been probably going to go home early that night, it's probably a vehicle that I probably would have went and stopped because it had the loud exhaust and it was kind of an old junky minivan. So I saw that van go by and go south. So when I left, I pulled out of the car lot, went up Delaware Avenue, which is kind of the main road that goes into the south side of town and drove on into the office. And as I'm just pulling in the office, call went out for this disabled vehicle on 423, sitting in the roadway. A road hazard. Okay, what's the problem, sir? Uh, here on 423, just south of uh, Newman's Clarkson Road, mm -hmm. there's a van sitting along the road. You don't have no flashes on or nothing. What kind of van is it? It's a white van. Oh. It's a Ford, I think. Okay, we'll take care of it. All right, thank you. Bye. And I think Brandy knew I was going home earlier or whatever. So Matt Robbins was our dispatcher. He gave it to me initially. And Brandy piped up like he normally would because he was never, he never shirked calls. He was always energetic. 5100 and 7. Good. Yeah. Hey, Rob, 423 South, just south of Newman's Cardington. There's a, uh, looks like a disabled white van on the side of the road. No hazards, uh, possibly on the roadway. Okay. You know. No big deal. Disabled vehicle. Nothing, no, no reason to be alarmed on anything. So I go in the office and uh, start finishing up some paperwork stuff so I can go home. And I know I hear Brandy signal out with the car. I, I, don't, I didn't pick up all this traffic. Like I said, I, I wasn't, you know, regretfully, I wasn't paying real close attention because it was just a disabled vehicle and I, I knew where he was. Welcome. Bye. Bye. The, the uh, gas tenant did not know they were walking. 
Sergeant. I believe it's going to be the driver of six is disabled. doing some paperwork and stuff and then Matt Robbins said and, and Russ Rigney was on a call at Kroger down on Delaware Avenue the south side of town he was on a unauthorized use of a motor vehicle call at the Kroger uh, grocery store so he's already on a call and that's why and then so Brandy went and handled the d- disabled and I had just got on station and while they're both dealing with those calls uh, Morrow County which is the next county east of it had a transport officer going to our juvenile detention center they were they didn't have one so they were bringing their juvenile to our detention center he gets behind a vehicle on stay around 95 and calls it as a possible drunk driver so Matt tells me Matt tells me hey I got a possible drunk driver on 95 I said alright I'll go check it so I go over that way go down 23 and I know Brandy has some traffic and stuff and nothing's still too alarming it was more confusing I guess I, I could tell he's maybe confused but it wasn't alarmed so I go down 95 and I see this car that got called as a fossil drunk driver. It, we had a BP gas station on 95. I stopped it and it pulled in the gas station. So I'm out running my guy and checking him, make sure he's not drunk and this and that. And he ended up being an older guy heading to work. Ended up not being anything. I, I ran I ran his license, made sure he was a valid driver and all this. And uh, during this time, Brandy finds somebody walking. Thanks for doing it. And he gets out and, he, and he's running the guy and, uh, based on a date of birth that he was given him. And he ra- he gave a date of birth of 431 of whatever. If I'd have heard that, I'd have said, there ain't 31 days in April. It would have like maybe triggered something. Well, and it, and it didn't alert, or alert anybody at the time. Thanks for doing that.
So I leave my call, my drunk driver call, and I go back towards the station. On my way back in, just a minute or two later, Matt Robbins is running a checkup on Brandy, and he's not answering. And then as I get close to the office, he did it again, and he's not answering. 5100 unit 6, checkup. 5100 unit 6, checkup. 5100 unit 40. Start heading towards Six's location, possibly on Wall the Western Road off of Emmy uh, Wall the Western Road. I haven't been able to make contact him with via 51, via 41 break. 45. I'd imagine the store is only catching part of your traffic. Go ahead. Start heading towards Waldo Western. That's where Six said he was in route to transporting a stable subject. I'm not able to raise him on the radio. 41. Sorry. 5100 to 6, check up. 5100 to 6, check up. 5100 to 6, check up. So I, I park and I walk in the front door and I, rem I literally said to Matt Robbins, I said, why in the hell is he not answering his radio? He said, I don't know. I said, did you try his cell phone? He said, yeah, he's not, I didn't get an answer. I said, well, all right, where was he last at? And he told me he was down on 423. And he was driving this. He was driving him around looking for the cars. What I, the last I knew that he was doing, he was giving out some locations on where the car might be located. I said, "All right." I said, "I'm going to head that way." I said, "See if Russ can head that way from Kroger because he was a lot closer than me at that point." So I leave the office, and he's still running checkups and not getting an answer. And I, I got on I got on 23, and I'm heading south towards Waldo. You know, and I'm so then you'll hear me on the radio. I thought maybe. Maybe hearing his supervisor's voice will make him perk up a little more or something. Eight to six, check up. Eight to six, check up. And of course, still nothing. I also have a post unit who is on 23 South, heading toward the area as well. 5100 to 40, six picked up the subject in front of 4967, stay route 423 South. I get down to Bethlehem Road, which crosses over from 23 to 423 in a little straight shot. I get down there and go cut across Bethlehem Road. And the only thing noteworthy about that, and we're still, we don't have any idea where Brandy's at. So about the time I get to 423 and Bethlehem Road, Rush Rigney goes flying by me, heading towards Waldo. And right about that time, Matt puts out on the radio that a, a gentleman was pulled over with a crew with a car in the ditch upside down at uh, 423 and uh, Wolfinger. 5100 unit 40. At 423, just south of Bethlehem, there's a report of a code four vehicle on its top. Okay. I'll be coming from Waldo West. I just got on it. You're clear. It's eight. If you're in route down there, it's going to be a vehicle. It's going to be way down in the ditch near a bridge. I saw Russ hit the brakes and start turning around. I turned and went north. And as I'm coming up that way, I, I, somewhere in there a few seconds later, Matt said, he said it's a cruiser. 5100 unit 8, the plane is advising that it is an SO vehicle in the ditch. Clear. Did I just south? Affirmative, just south of Bethlehem Road on 423. It's going to be right before the bridge in, in the ditch. Okay. Clear. Should be a black Chevy pickup there with his hazards on. That's going to be the complaint. Correction, Ford pickup. Okay. 
There should be a big white barn farmhouse across the road from the location. Good right on, I see a pickup truck. We're heading north of the limits, maybe? Fifty one hundred, double check the crossroads. The complaint's advising is just south of Bethlehem. Fifty one hundred, I just came from Bethlehem Road all the way back to Area One. I've not passed the pickup truck nor a cruiser to the ditch. Try going north of there then. Fifty one hundred, unit forty. Start going north on four twenty three. Apparently, there's two MPD units out with it. You know, and my initial thought was that Brandy was driving this guy around and maybe fell asleep or something and wrecked his cruiser. So, you know, so now I'm, I'm, I'm going into panic mode, but I still didn't know how bad it was at the time. Andy Isom and Dan Ice were working in Marion City at the time, and they were pretty good friends with Brandy, and they heard that he wasn't checking his, answering his checkups and stuff, so they started heading south out of the city. And they got to the cruiser just probably 30 seconds before I did. And they confirmed that it was a cru- Brandy's cruiser, and he was upside down in a ravine off the east side of 423. 37. There. 40, 37. So I pulled up, and then I ran down the embankment, and Brandy was in there in the front, upside down, hanging upside down in the car. And, uh, of course, then Russ Rigney showed up, too. So I got in. I crawled in the driver's window and was trying to, like, pull him out while his, his feet were wedged underneath the dash where, where the car had rolled. So I said, Russ, I can't get his legs loose. So I jumped out, and I ran around to the passenger side to where his legs kind of were. And Russ crawled in the driver's side, and he was able to and – and Brandy's head was all twisted up. I mean, it was, I was – I thought at that point still that maybe he had, he had a broken neck. Well, Russ was able to wedge his head around a little bit, and I got his pulled on his legs, and he kind of just fell out. And the next thing I know, he, he just went out the driver's side. He disappeared away from me because Russ and Dan and Andy all pulled him out. Just to get the 31 ASAP. You're clear. 5140, 30, 29's en route. Okay. Hey, Thunder. I got back around to the other side. He was covered in blood, covered in blood. And by the time I got around to the driver's side, Andy Isom said, Lee, he's been shot. Brandy pulled over. He stopped behind Juan on the roadway to check on him. Brandy got out and he stood in front of his squad talking to Juan in the headlights. Juan told him that his car broke down. Juan gave him the name of his brother-in-law, Ramon Espinosa. He didn't give him his real name. He wanted Brandy to just go away and leave him alone. He didn't tell Brandy about the van. Juan was hoping Brandy would just let him keep walking. Brandy offered him a ride, and Juan felt he didn't have a choice but to get into the squad, so he got into the back seat. Juan asked him for a ride to the apartment complex in Marion. Brandy then turned around. He said he wanted to check on Juan's car before he took him to Marion just to make sure it wasn't a road hazard. This is the last time anyone heard from Brandy. Authorities believe that the radio noise that was heard after Brandy told dispatch to stand by was when Brandy was shot. Lieutenant McDonald, who was one of the officers at the scene of the crash, stayed behind to secure the scene. And I didn't go to the hospital. I, I, I tried to stay there and keep control of this crime scene and, and to try to 
you know, let, let's figure this out. And then, uh, you know, people are showing up and, and, and I'm like, uh, no, he, he's gone. And they're like, you don't know, maybe not. And I'm like, I, I've been a cop now for, for 10 years. I know, you know, I, I, I know. You know they, they, it was seven in the morning or whatever time it was. And now it's 4.30 in the afternoon and you hadn't gone home yet. And, and you're trying to, you know, we got a piece together and you got suspect and, and we got places to search. And you know, I, I grew up in the city and then I'm, you know, moved here and became, and I'm, I'm searching barns with animals in them. And, uh, you know, like, what the, you know, cause we were going to do whatever we had to do and, and, and we were going to, we were going to get it done. And, you know, it, you know, the, the law enforcement community really, you, you hear the stories, but you don't know until you see it. And, and we were going to get it done. We were going to find out what happened and we were going to, you know, find the, find the bad guy and we were, and, and we had to do it and we had to get it done. And we, and we, and, and we eventually did. Detectives discovered Cruz had a domestic violence and rape charge against him for beating his pregnant girlfriend with a crowbar. These charges were dropped months later when the victim couldn't be located to testify. Some think that maybe Cruz had been unsure if there might still have been warrants out for him for that case, thinking that may explain why he lied about his name and date of birth and why he eventually shot Brandy to get away. While several agencies were on the scene or arriving at the scene, Brandy's dad, Detective Rick Winfield, heard all of the radio traffic and he heard his son's ID, County 6, and he called into dispatch. Fire. Well, it's one uh-huh. The fuck's going on County 6? He had a record. Nine, nine, six, eight, 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 we don't have any idea. All we know is he was taken, giving somebody, somebody's car broke down. He was giving them a ride and taking them out the wall of Fulton Road. They went. They, they started trying to call him. They called him, called him, called him. He didn't answer. They paged him. He didn't answer. Everybody's been out looking for him. They finally found him on his top out there. All right. Okay. They're still out the scene with him, so he wants to call you as soon as they go. All right. All right, man. Be cool, and we'll, as soon as we know, we'll call you. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. All Rick could do now is sit at home and wait to hear what was going on with the son. Eventually, dispatch would call him back when they were transporting Brandy to the hospital. in the morning the phone started ringing which i still had a landline phone at the time well i remember land it was in bed with me and i had to roll over top of him to get the phone and i thought to myself i'm gonna kick brandy's butt why is he calling me this early because a lot of times if it was you know snow or fog or something like that brandy would call and say hey you might want to get up early because i worked at the time i worked at the county board of developmental disabilities as a secretary and it was in union county of marysville that's 45 minutes away so if, you know it was going to be bad he would call and let me know and I was thinking to myself, I'm going to pick this bus way too early to be calling me. And I answered the phone, thinking it was going to be him. And my father in law was very panicked. He said, Sarah, they found Brandy's cruiser upside down the ditch. Get the boys to go to the hospital. And like, I was out of bed getting dressed. I called my office, said, I've, I've got to go. Brandy's wrecked the cruiser. And I'm thinking, you know, at the time he worked a second job at a, at a farm. And I thought he fell asleep. He's not getting enough sleep. We're going to have to look at the situation. He needs to stop working so much. I grabbed both the boys, didn't change diapers, nothing, just threw them in the van and left. And on the way there, I remember thinking, okay, this isn't good. They had to, they didn't have kids to give her, they had to beat me there. And they haven't called to tell me everything's okay to take my time. I walked in the front entrance where he would be seen, because I didn't know any better. I had both boys with me. Um, I was carrying Tyler, Lando, I was holding his hand and walking. And the girl came out the front entrance and she's you know, thinking, probably I'm there to be seen for ear infection or something for one of the boys. And she said, can I help you? And I said, they brought my husband here. He's a deputy. And she wouldn't look at me. She kept looking down. 
and I wouldn't move, and I she kept saying, I'll take you back to the ER. I'll take you back to the ER. She just kept repeating that, and I wouldn't move, and I looked at her, and I said, he didn't make it, did he? And she put her head down and took her head no. So that night, I was home in bed, and uh, I got a call from our dispatcher, my, uh, Matt Robbins. He called us, and... Um, he called me and, you know, again, there's no, again, no cell phone. You know, some people, Nextels and, and uh, pagers and stuff were a thing. But uh, I didn't have one. I was, I'm always slow on the curve with <laughs> with that stuff. But, yeah, phone rings and, and uh, I answer the phone and he just said, hey, we're calling everybody in. Brandy's car was found flipped over uh, in, a, in a ditch or a ravine, I think he said, down on 423 with you know south of town and uh we're calling everybody in and i went oh and you know we're on i mean and you know you probably know this you don't ask a lot of questions because that dispatcher has to make 20 phone calls wow so i said i I, all i said was i said do we know is he okay or do we know where he is and he goes he's at the hospital and i said okay so at that time i and my wife said what you know what's going on and i told her and i said well i and it was really strange because I felt like I needed, I felt like I needed to take a shower and get ready, like for work, rather than going running right out the door, because I thought, there, that's just weird. And I told, I told my wife, I said, he prop, I, and I think I called him, I think I called him dumbass. I said, well, dumbass fell asleep at the, and I thought, I said, fell asleep at the wheel and put his car in a ditch. And I said, he's at the hospital. And I knew he was working for that farmer at the time. And I do have been working crazy hours at both at work and for that farmer. And he was burning the candle at both ends. And he probably, you know, I just assumed that he fell asleep at the wheel. Yeah. So I, and I'm glad, I, I'm so glad I did. But I took a shower, got my stuff around. And uh, we take our cruisers home. So <clears throat> I went out and uh, flipped everything on and got on the radio and signaled on the air. And they cleared me and it was dead silent. And... Uh, I thought, well, that's weird. And I had told my wife, I said, well, I'm going to go to the hospital, see how he's doing, and I'm going to go see if I need to go pick up Sarah and take her, you know, take her to the uh, to the hospital or, you know, get arranged, you know, because by that time she had Tyler, too. So they, so I thought, you know, there she is home with two little kids. And so I went to the hospital, and I just remember turning in there and turning up. And the way, it, it's hard to describe, but the way it's laid out, you turn up a long driveway to get to where you're going and you can kind of see the side of the building and the emergency rooms on the back side of it well there were people everywhere and uh, it was kind of hazy out and it was it wasn't you know it's it October 14th so I, I think it was kind of hazy it was it wasn't wasn't real cold but it wasn't real warm it's was probably in the 50s maybe or in the 40s but you know I remember just pulling up there and uh the first and I people everywhere and fire trucks and squads and firemen and cops and I, good lord and uh, it still didn't. I, it still didn't quite click. It was like I knew something was weird, but I thought what? it just it didn't click. There wasn't because we're not. I mean, we at that time, you know, our our line, our work here was more like bar fights and domestics and things like that. So there was a modicum of violence. But I mean, we were always you know thumping people and getting thumbs and all, <laughs> and all that. But there wasn't there wasn't a lot of you know a lot of like you know hardcore you know like this and uh, so I, it didn't it didn't quite register but i remember the first person that i that i spoke that i saw was Corey and he, his brother Corey, and he was standing down on the standing on the like away from everybody he was just kind of standing there and i walked up i said man what's going on and he said they killed him and i said what he said they killed him i said who killed who he said they killed brandy i said who killed brandy he said mexican i said what yeah I said, what? I said, are we, you know, I'm thinking Mexicans. We don't, I mean, there, it, it didn't even, like, we don't have a gang problem. I mean, that's just, you know, what? If, <laughs> so I'm walking up towards the hospital, and then the next thing is Sarah comes blasting out the out the doors, and she was, I mean, I, she was just, I don't know, frantic, furious, uh, hysterical, pissed, all at the same time. So then she came out, and she, and, and it was, the, the she said, they murdered him, and I want you to speak at his funeral. <laughs> like that. I mean, she, of course, you know, she's hysterical. And, I, and I, I'm and i still trying to trying to register, like, wait a minute. So I, and then I walk inside, and then there's a, one of our, uh, another really good guy, uh, Russ Rigney. He's one of our, he was a, kind of our old salt deputy, and he was back on nights. And he was, he, I remember him standing in there. He was standing outside the, the room that, that, uh, 
but they had Brandy in and he was, you know, and I walked up to him and I said, what? And he, he couldn't really talk. I mean, he was trying to kind of, he was just, you know, answer. And Russ and I are buds. I mean, we, Russ, Russ was kind of my mentor. He was, he, when I first hired him, I used to, I rode with him a lot and everything. He was staying there and I think he had blood up to his elbows and, uh, he was pretty, pretty rattled. And, uh, you know, I, I said, can I go in there? And he said, no, it's a crime scene. And I said, okay. And then he, one of the nurses came up to him and said, you really need to watch. And uh, so I stood at the door and I stood there at the door and he went and, you know, cleaned himself up. And then he came back over. And I just remember people everywhere, cops and, you know, people in and out and everywhere and stuff. And um, there was a, a police officer, a city police officer that came in at some point. Her name was Electa Foster and she took photos in the in the room and of, of brandy and then i the rest of that night is kind of a blur so i knew going back dead but i'm thinking he was in a car accident and when i walk in the place is already sold up and then he just been brought in but it's already sold up russ frickney was standing guard at the trauma bay where they had brandy's body and then somebody took one of the Somebody ripped Tyler out of my arms and somebody took Landon and the doctor walked up to me and she said, hi, your husband was shot right here and pointed behind her right ear. Do you want to see his body? And that's how I found out he was shot. Law enforcement from the county, city, and state, they swarmed the area on foot with canines and by air searching for Juan Cruz. Officers and detectives continued searching and patrolling the area for Cruz on Thursday and on Friday, reaching out to their Hispanic population for help in finding Brandy's killer. Officers in Delaware were also digging to find out any information about where Cruz may be hiding. While there was certainly a concern that he may have been headed south to Mexico, they believed he was either still in Marion or in Delaware. Outside the Winfield home, there was shock and sadness that spread throughout the law enforcement community and an entire city. It's impacted many of us here today. I know it's very, very quiet here. Flags fly at half staff at Marion Harding High School, where Brandy Winfield graduated in 1994. He was very respectful, unselfish, um, honest, loyal. Principal Mike McCreary has known Brandy since his days at Taft Middle School, where a young boy persevered from seventh grade basketball manager to making the team the following year. Brandy was an excellent student when it came to hard work. He wasn't a valedictorian, but he knew what he had to do, he had goals. But it was his passion for his future profession that people here remember him for the most. He dared to be different, and he dared to be great. And anyone who knew him says he truly was. In Marion County, Christine Dobbin, 10 TV Eyewitness News. Their challenge, which actually was Cruz's advantage, is that they were nearing harvest season in that area, and the corn was really tall. Hundreds of acres of corn between where they found Brandy's squad and the city. But these cops weren't giving up. These were Brandy's friends. They were Brandy's family. They were determined to find Cruz. And then, early Friday evening, the tips started coming in. Nine on one. Yes, officer, um, come to Pitting Pitting Heights Road. The, the guy is like, you guys looking for it? He's right here. Hurry up. My name is Moises Garcia. Come on over here. He's at 1375? No, he he just ran over here to 1381. Come on. Okay, we'll get somebody out there. Okay. They think 1357. They think they think they think he broke into the apartment down there. Okay. You yeah, think he's in there now? They think he might have gone in there. I got somebody calling said he saw him. Somebody called me from 1375 said they saw him running across there. Uh, Gretchen's talking to somebody that thinks he broke into 1357. Okay. Suspect is still there. Suspect is still there. I'm setting the tone now. All right, we're on. All right. All right, he's still there? Yes. Yeah. 
Look straight ahead. Are you okay? Either the Crescent Heights apparently subject took off running south down a Crescent Heights, come on 64. Okay, there's a car turning left. I don't know what kind of car is going. Crescent Heights, possible 12A break. Subject possibly going to be the subject we're looking for. Otherwise, he broke in at 1357, took off running towards Kroger. Apparently, we're not wearing a shirt. 64, I got units responding from dispatch. Okay. 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 Uh, he ran to me, but I haven't seen him walking from the uh, cover to the Okay, we got people on the way down there right now. Uh, there's a truck pulling out, too. There's only two trucks pulling out, and I haven't seen him run for work. Because I ran with that horn. Okay, we got people on the way there. Signal one. Okay, we got them down the way. Okay, I'll be still uh, here. All right, thank you. We were looking and looking and couldn't find him. And, and the funeral's coming up, and we needed to find him before this funeral. And I'm working at a high school football game, and the radio's going, going, and going. We got Tip, and he's in this apartment complex. And, you know, more cops are going there, and more cops are going there. And the safety director, his name was Dale Osborne, comes up to me, and I'm like, uh, uh, you know, tell him what's going on. I'm like, uh, God, I got, I got to get over there. And he's like, go, just go. So we left one guy at the football game, there were six of us, five of us left, and, and went screaming down to this apartment complex and in different places. It was a, uh, you know, just everybody was converging on this apartment complex and, you know, they had, there was people there making assignments and uh, I went right to the apartment and there was uh, bosses there, Tom Robbins and Al Hayden. Tom Robbins was one of my bosses, Al Hayden was the number two guy at the sheriff's office. There was a, uh, a detective who said that he was in an apartment building across the courtyard who said he could see a fight inside the apartment. And I'm like, we gotta go, we gotta go. And other people were saying, we gotta go. I don't want it to make it sound like I was making decisions. And I was like, certainly wasn't. I'm just talking from my perspective. So a group of us went up the steps and into this apartment. And uh, we were confronted by a guy who wasn't Cruz, who wanted to wrestle with us. And I remember Tom Robbins, who was my boss and I, uh, engaged this guy and the rest of the the rest of the team went into the apartment and found Juan Cruz hiding in the closet. And, uh, and we dragged him out. And supposedly he had a club foot. And I remember Juan Cruz getting dragged out of that apartment and thrown on the ground and we you know, yanked his shoe off. And the, the people who lived in that apartment complex cheering for us. They, well, they were screaming for us to, you know, to, uh, to kill him. And obviously we didn't. It was bad. My, you know, my wife was there as a deputy. Just, just the sense of relief we had that we were able to get him in jail before the funeral was, was amazing. It was, you know, the fall of the year, so football season was going on, and we had a bunch of high school football games on, and pretty much everybody had worked 24, 30-some hours straight. And I was at a high school football game when the dispatch center called and said that they had received a call from a Hispanic male out in that Crescent Heights apartment area. And I immediately uh, left the ball game and headed straight to that area, which is a, a pretty good distance. You know, it's probably a 10, 15 minute drive. So while I'm responding to that area, I basically took charge over the radio and had a perimeter set up uh, around that apartment complex. And we got a good perimeter set up. Uh, there was some some information that maybe he'd gotten in a blue van that had, that had left the area, and I decided to maintain the perimeter. You know, said the state patrol can go look for that van, but we're going to maintain this perimeter because that's the best information that we have. So that call ended up progressing. Uh, you know, the Hispanic male spoke pretty good English. He was he was at. I mean, we had saturated 
you know, the area so much that everybody around the county knew who we were looking for and the description of the guy and so on. So this is Spain McNeil said, you know, without a doubt, this is the guy you're looking for. He lived out in that complex also and he said, you know, I saw him heading away from my apartment towards the south, but he didn't actually see him go in anywhere else. You know, after we get the perimeter set up and corresponding back and forth, and, and then we start pushing guys into the apartment complex to try to meet up with this caller, we were tipped off by somebody else in the complex and said, look, I think he just broke into that apartment or kicked the door in and went in that apartment. And so within minutes, you know, we had guys who maintained the perimeter and had other people going in into the apartment complex and within a matter of a couple minutes uh, the radio traffic escalated to the fact that they think he's in this one particular apartment they are like two story apartments as soon as you go in there's, there's generally a stairwell that goes up to the second floor and immediately when they got inside they encountered a different Hispanic male and got into a tussle with him about coming in the apartment and they just put him out of the way and cuffed him up and and then pushed further into the apartment and, and found Juan. You know, he wasn't very cooperative. Uh, he obviously didn't want to go to jail. He knew he'd been caught. It was almost like, uh, you know, trapping an animal in the corner. You know, he's in a closet. He can't go nowhere. So uh, there was a little bit of a fight on at that point. And finally getting him under control, getting him cuffed up. And you know, there was a lot of neighbors out by then in the apartment complex. And... You know, everybody just started clapping because they knew, you know, that, that it had finally come to a conclusion. There were deputies cheering. There were there were people in the apartment complexes cheering. Uh, there were police officers cheering. It, it's it's unbelievable. And, and there, there was a, a, a guy there that I never got along with, to be honest with you. Uh, and he worked at the sheriff's office at the time. And, and he and I just grabbed each other and just started hugging each other. And, and it was just uh, very emotional. Matt then cleared from the apartment complex and went back to the football game. I left there after we got him secured on, on the way to, to be interviewed. And I left there and I went back to the football game, of course, because we had to have people there. And I went to the press box and I told him, you know, please announce the crowd that the, the suspect and, and Deputy Winfield's murder has been arrested. And they, they set it over the loudspeaker and the entire stadium just erupted. This was simply great cop work. In under 48 hours, they went from finding a murdered officer with no leads to identifying and arresting crews at an apartment complex with no additional injuries to more cops or to the public. No high-tech investigations, no cell phone tracking, no internet tracing. Just multiple agencies who dropped everything to work together with the community to find Brandy's killer. Tonight on The Night Beat, a search for a murder suspect ends here. I was running and dialed 911 and I did, I think I did it twice. Tonight, the man who helped police catch a suspected cop killer. 10TV Night Beat starts now. This is the apartment complex where Juan Cruz was captured, a complex filled with residents who were more than willing to help catch a suspected cop killer. It was around 8.30 last night when residents say Cruz was seen jumping this fence. Then he tried to break into this apartment by busting out the window. When someone yelled at him, he ran. I see a man running this way. Out of fear of retaliation from Cruz's family, this resident doesn't want to be identified. I did chase him just with a phone in my hand. And a 911 dispatcher on the line. More than three dozen officers responded to a multitude of 911 calls from residents. This home video was taken by Eric Wilson. All of a sudden, like mad cops came and we were blocked in. Police found Cruz fighting with a man who may or may not be related to the case inside this apartment. His capture ends a two-day manhunt following the murder of Deputy Brandy Winfield. Police say Winfield stopped to help Cruz and another suspect who was already in custody when they ran out of gas. An act of kindness which turned into a fatal mistake. He did something wrong, he has to pay for it. As far as the reward money, he says he doesn't care if he gets it or not. As long as people know there are his Hispanic men and women like him who are good people. And I want 
to know everybody, to let everybody know that not all the Mexicans are the same. All city and county offices will be closed here in Marion County in honor of Deputy Winfield, so crews will not appear before a judge until Tuesday morning. In Marion County, Eric James, CTV, Nightbeat. While the prosecution believed that Brandy had been a hostage and the windows were broken during the crash, there was another theory. Some believed that when Brandy stopped to confront Cruz about the false date of birth, he got shot by Cruz. Then Cruz shot the back window out of the squad to get out. They believed that this would explain the area of the roadway where Sergeant Blair found glass while he was looking for Brandy. When I went across Sports Bethlehem Road, I just happened to notice there was a pile of glass laying in the road. Come to find out later on that that was the glass out of Brandy's cruiser window where Cruz shot him to get out of the back seat. But I saw that glass. During the whole ordeal that morning, I asked Tim Arrington, one of our state troopers, I said, hey, go down to 423 and get a sample of that glass. Because then I went down with Dennis Potts, our detective, like a day or two later, two days later, and we swept up all the glass. During Cruz's interview, he was asking detectives if they had found his glasses in the apartment where he was arrested. He described the glasses, and the description fit a pair of glasses that were found inside of Brandy's upside-down cruiser, glasses that had been placed into evidence. Placed into evidence because detectives knew Brandy didn't wear glasses. Yeah, I had, well, I came in that, I think the next night, after dark and everything, I think we, I don't know if people were still searching, but I know, you know, I had been working for about 40, 40 hours at this point. Uh, Russ, Russ Rigney and myself and Aaron Corwin came into the office and BCI brought, had went through his, uh, Brandy's cruiser and they brought down all the property they recovered from his cruiser. You know, and I, I remember, it's funny, we, we actually... We actually chuckled um, because when we started going through his stuff, Brandy had probably like thousands of paper clips and notepads, and <laughs> he was just that kind of guy. He, he had, if, if he needed a little, then he need, he better have a lot, you know. I mean, very organized, you know. Um, you know, had like uh, like files for paperwork, and but we got going through all that stuff, and at one point. I don't remember if it was Aaron or Russ pulled out. I think it was Russ pulled out a pair of glasses and said, Brandy don't wear glasses, does he? And we're like, no, I don't think so. And so we went, so he took them upstairs and gave them to somebody and ended up being those were Cruz's glasses. During the interview with Luis Hernandez, his story matched the events that took place that night, placing Juan as the shooter. Luis was actually in the van when officers were responding to the crash, and then he drove off without being stopped. The one key piece of evidence that was never found in this case was the gun used to murder Brandy. Even though the evidence pointed to a different scenario, the prosecutor was ready to go to trial with the theory that Brandy had been held hostage at gunpoint, and while Brandy was driving the cruiser, Cruz shot him which caused the cruiser to flip upside down. This is the story the prosecutor was going to trial with and had the Winfield family believing for weeks. I originally met with the prosecutor the first time I met with him. We went into his office and he was explaining what evidence they had. And he tells me they had Brandy's blood on the pants. Uh, at the time, they didn't have DNA back yet because so it was pretty shortly after the incident that we first met with him. So they knew it was Brandy's blood type on his pants. So they were pretty sure Brandy's blood is on his pants. And he tells us that um, he thinks what happened was that Brandy was driving. They had an eight-minute gap in the radio traffic from the time that Brandy said standby, which I listened to the tapes later. It's being 911 dispatcher listening to the tapes was important to me. So I listened to those, and you can tell Brandy's annoyed when he says standby. And then there's eight minutes that goes by that they don't hear anything from him. And then there's the um, strange sound on the radio, which they think is the cruiser flipping. It's either it's flipping or him being shot, but I think with the timeline, it's the cruiser flipping or long cruiser moving his body inside. So he tells me that Brandy's driving the cruiser for eight minutes, being held hostage at gunpoint, and um, gets shot and the cruiser flips upside down. And he's 
found on the roof of the cruiser. And I immediately said, Brandy wore a seatbelt all the time. And he said, well, he must not have had it on. He took it off for some reason. And I, at the time, I just was, in my mind, I'm thinking that's not possible. Brandy wore his seatbelt after he went. So it didn't make sense to me. So we go through the entire year, all the motions, all the hearings that I go to, and then they come to us for a plea deal. And uh, we met as a family. The prosecutor sat down and explained everything he had. Um, and then during this entire nine to ten months, I believe my husband held hostage, has time to think about what's going to happen to him, trying to get out of a situation with a gun held on him. Um, so, you know, that's pretty damaging to think about. And um, so the prosecutor comes to us with a plea deal. We have a death penalty case coming up. We have the Mexican consulate involved. Um, and he says they're offering... 43 years of life. They were going to do 30 years on the murder. At the time, they had charged him with kidnapping, the so 10 years on the kidnapping, and a three-year gun spec. So the family, we all got together, um, went to dinner, and sat and discussed pros and cons. Um, surely, his mother didn't feel like she could make it through a trial. I didn't feel like I could make it through a trial. I was concerned, and having talked to other um, cops, widows, and families, you know what a death penalty conviction is like that you have this gap over and over again. You have years of appeals. And the prosecutor had presented his evidence to us. He was very concerned that he had a fingerprint in blood that had not been identified yet. It was on the guardrail. They had done all the first responders, all the deputies, everybody that had been in the area, and they had not matched that fingerprint to anybody, and it's in blood. So we were really concerned as a family that that would raise reasonable doubt for a jury, that somebody else was at that scene. So they do the, they do, we did a three judge panel and we accepted a plea deal and they had to change the charge. They did a confession afterwards and they had to change the charge of kidnapping to Grand Theft Auto of the cruiser because in the confession they found out, like I said, Brandy had his seatbelt on. Right. Like I had originally said, Brandy had his seatbelt on. And if you, when I went and viewed the cruiser after the plea deal was completed, I was allowed to see all the evidence, get back stuff after I think it was 90 days. I had to wait to get my stuff back or Brandy's belongings back. And I viewed the cruiser, if you pull the seatbelt down, like somebody has it on, there's blood across it. And the, pro- did the prosecutor totally missed this. So Brandy had his seatbelt on when he was shot. Yeah, and this, this prosecutor got it all wrong. That's not what happened at all. And he let our family believe for, you know, 10 months that Brandy was held hostage. And what, what really happened is that when he stopped the cruiser on Bethlehem Road and turned around to confront Juan Cruz, had the partition open, talking to him. When As soon as he turned around to confront Juan Cruz about lying about his name at DOB, he was shot immediately. Had his seatbelt on, blood got all over the seatbelt. Cruz is now stuck in the back of the cruiser, shoots out the back window, pushes Brandy aside. And if you look at photos, there's a lot of blood dripping down and across that seat where he lays. Not at, There's no way that if he was shot and went upside down immediately, there'd be that much blood across that seat. So every piece of evidence, and so that prosecutor, he decided he thought he knew what happened and never paid attention to what the evidence told him. There was glass on Bethlehem Road. If there's In the reports, if you look through, they're trying to figure out why there's not enough rear with defrost patterns through it at the scene. So there, and Lee Blair, on the way, you're looking for a car accident. So, you know, you're, as a deputy, you're looking around for a tri- tire mark. You're looking for things that would be evidence of an accident because they're having a hard time finding it. And he noted glass on Bethlehem Road. And they drove, like they started, I know that they were looking for other car accidents to see if glass got left on the road from another car accident. The prosecutor's trying to make things fit what he thought happened and not what actually happened. And with, you know, him not knowing, and those those were major concerns. I'm so glad we took the plea deal. Because he would have went to trial with things all wrong, and it would have opened things up for the attorneys to attack it. During his confession, Cruz avoided answering many questions, saying he just didn't remember. He indicated he was intoxicated and he was high at the time, and he just didn't like or trust cops. That he had been treated bad by them in the past. He indicated he had acquired a gun a few days earlier and had it in his pants while he and Luis were walking back to the van. Due to his impairment, he said he couldn't keep up with Luis walking. Detectives believe Luis may have ducked off the roadway to hide when he saw Brandy's cruiser approaching behind him and stopped with Cruz. 
the sound on the radio after Brandy told dispatch to stand by is likely when Brandy was murdered. 51 Hardy at 6. Calling hours was Sunday. We started at 2 p.m. And um, I did not bring the boys. I didn't think they could handle it. I had some neighbors that watched the boys for me. Um, so we started at 2 p.m. We did not have any breaks. And we went. I finally left at 8 p.m. And I walked the line with the deputy standing beside me to make sure I didn't miss anybody that I wanted to see. Um, the line was eight to nine hours long. Um, and still going after I left. Um, it was already out the door when I got there. We had a private visitation first at the funeral home with a few officers and family. Um, I remember when I walked in and saw him for the first time, I remember Nick Malo, who was very close to Brandy, the state trooper was standing casket guard. And as I you know, walked over and viewed Brandy for the first time, just the tears running down his face as he trying to keep it together and trying to stay at attention watching me see my husband for the first time. I like never forget that. Um, so I was, as I, as I, walked, I walked the line looking for people I know and this is like a funny memory. Um, so when we went and planned the funeral, Brian drove me over and sort of planned the funeral at the funeral home and he says, um, the funeral director is very nervous with me. And he's like, well, I'm thinking it's going to be a rather large service, so maybe because we're having it at the fairground coliseum we should open the concession stand. And I just looked at him dead on just who I am as a person. I said, we're not serving nachos at my husband's funeral. <laughs> and then he goes, I met more coffee service. I said, well, then say coffee service. And I look at Brian, I start laughing. I said, Brandy would be the first person in line for nachos at a funeral. And we both started cracking up laughing because it's true. He'd be like, hey, good idea. He'd have some like nacho cheese on his face. So as I walked in the line that night, Brian's walking with me, the Marion area Harley riders were all in their full Harley gear to walk to the funeral, and they're all at the concession stand buying coffee. And I yelled out, are there any nachos? And they all started crying up laughing, not knowing who I am. So, you know, even at a funeral, I still maintain my sense of humor. That's who Brandy and I were as a couple. We'd have a sense of humor about things, and you got to laugh sometimes. Between 1,500 and 2,000 officers attended Brandy's funeral, and there was a procession of cruisers at least five to six miles long. They had it in the county fairgrounds coliseum, and just the, the numbers of people who came out from regular citizens to, dig, to dignitaries who came and and you know I'll never forget that the Winfield family just you know greeting all of them and, and being there to uh, you know uh, you know let let people let people show their support and then uh, the day of the funeral it just rained it was cold it rained and people still came and lined the street so just just a wonderful outpouring by the community um, at the funeral, I rode with Brian. I was in his cruiser. Um, so once again, he wouldn't leave my side. Brian would not leave my side. He sat with me. There was a row of, and one side of the Coliseum was all Marion City. He had it on the floor, all the Marion County deputies first, and then Marion City, and then um, Union County, since I had worked with them, were on the floor, and then the Richwood Fire Department, which was the fire department that Brady ran with. And then all of them stood up and one by one went by and flew to the casket, which was just breathtaking to watch each officer. Sheriff Bailey attempted to be the last one to salute my husband. And I leaned over to Brian and said, that man's not going to be the last one to salute my husband and get on up there. So Brian was the last one to salute Brandy. I read um, a letter Brandy wrote to me on New Year's Eve that year at the funeral. I stood up and did a little speech just thanking people and um, I said, I, I wanted to thank them for sharing Brandy with me and for, you know, because that's what I felt like I shared Brandy with the whole entire community. And I got used to sharing him with the community and I understood why by the show of support we had from the community. I remember walking out, it was pouring rain. We walked out and um, everybody standing at attention, all the officers that were there, they had them out standing at attention as the casket came out to be loaded. 
And um, when they released them, they all leaned forward, and those hats, you know, those deputy hats, they leaned forward in the water, just pouring off of their hats. And then I was directly behind the hearse in Brian's cruiser, and just the street line with people in the pouring rain, and it was cold that day, pouring rain, waiting to just, you know, take a glimpse as we went by. So when we got to the cemetery, I remember my my mother-in-law was sitting in a chair, my sister-in-law was sitting in a chair, and I was sitting in a chair, and then Rick and Corey are behind Lindsay and Shirley, and they're hugging them after everything's over, and I was sitting there thinking, they have support, and the only person I want is sitting in front of me in this casket. And then I couldn't go to dinner afterwards. I made Brian drive me around for a little bit. Somebody told me later the story, and I actually have a tattoo now of this, but when they were digging at the funeral or the uh, cemetery and getting things ready, there was a hawk, a red-tailed hawk that sat in a tree. And it never left the tree. And then it was still sitting there. Somebody took a photo of it, but I don't have it. It was still there when all these people, I mean, you've got thousands of people that filed into that cemetery. And you have a 21-gun salute. You have helicopters flying over. You have taps being played. The hawk stayed there the entire time. They said when the 21-gun salute went off, it just buried its head in its wing and never left the tree. So to me, it was like the hawk. I, you know, I take that as a symbol. When I see hawks, I think of Brandy. To me, it's like a representation of Brandy. The funeral was in our in our fairground coliseum. So you know, and again, it's it's for for people who've never been there. It, you know, I can I'm I'm looking at it in my head, but I mean, it's hard to describe. But you know, it was it was a big place, and um, it was filled. And the the one thing that I remember most that was overwhelming was the bagpipes. <clears throat> Yeah, I don't, I can't, I, I can't, I don't listen to them <laughs> but, anymore, but, but the, the, uh, the drum major was from, um, and it was, they're, they're, an, they're an awesome bagpipe band. They're from Cleveland, Ohio. They came in and that was, that was, uh, a, a very, very vivid memory. And then uh, another one is the, uh, just the overwhelming support from the, uh, you know, other law enforcement and just from the community and just. I don't know. I mean, it just, you know, the, uh, the way, the, the way it played out, I mean, there were the honor guards standing around all across the top and then like looking straight back, I could see the Columbus police wear white, they wear white shirts. And, um, I, yeah, I mean, everybody, you know, people wear variations of gray, black, blue, you know, and there was that everywhere, but the, but the, the Columbus police wear white now, they, they were all sitting together. And then the, um, the procession, when we left the fairgrounds of the, uh, the cemeteries on the South end of town and, um, you go through our town and you know i told you we're it's a railroad town so when we left the, the coliseum they take we have overpasses in in town that, that to go over the steps or go over the tracks and when we got to the top of the one southbound overpass going along i mean you know, just seeing the light all the way through town on the cruisers and everything um just amazing just amazing and and the rain that day <laughs> i it was just it was just I don't know how to describe it. It was just, uh, I don't think it's rained that hard. I mean, it's amazing. It, it, it just, it was a constant hard rain and just solid, you know, straight downpour and seeing all those guys and gals standing, you know, standing in the rain and everything, but it was just really, really something. And the final call was actually Monica and I pre-recorded that because we it wasn't going to be a dispatcher that knew him working. So we pre-recorded it together on a tape um, in my bedroom, and Monica did the call, and I answered. It took us a really long time to get it right. Yeah, she she marked fifty one hundred unit six, and she marked it several times. And I said um, fifty one uh, six is out of service. He's been called home. As a dispatcher, that's something I really wanted to do for him, though. I mean, Mo I wanted Monica as his favorite dispatcher doing the call, you know, calling it out. And we knew that we couldn't do it live, so we pre-recorded it, and she just held it up and played it. Brandy was buried October 18th in the Marion Cemetery. And Brandy and Sarah's sense of humor never wavered, even at his funeral. Because of a fight. We had our last fight. 
he was really in support of Bush at the time, which was an election year. And he was like just crazy about law enforcement for Bush. And he went and bought, and he was working on a farm with a farmer. So he got ordered a bunch of t-shirts. It was law enforcement for Bush and farm ranch for Bush. And I went to use the credit card at work one day to get gas. And it was denied. So I get online, I look, and I see that the last of our money was used at the, the law enforcement for Bush store. And he was sleeping, and I called and just ripped him a new one. I'm like, I cannot believe you didn't tell me that you spent this money. And he begged when they were already on the doorstep. So he begged, can I just keep my T-shirt? I'm like, fine, you can keep that T-shirt. Send the other stuff back. We need that money. Because I'm living on a cop salary and a secretary salary. So that morning when Brian came over, to, or that next day Brian came to get clothes, for, he was, he, Brian put his uniform together for me to wear. And I said, I gave him the, the law enforcement for both t-shirt. I said, he used our last bit of money. He's getting buried in this. So that was underneath his uniform. Brian was cracking up laughing. Yep, he got buried in that shirt because he used our last money for it. I won that fight. His parents, Rick and Shirley, were able to go to Washington, D.C. in May of 2005 and see Brandy's name on the National Law Enforcement Memorial Wall. Thirty-year-old Juan C. Cruz is serving a life sentence in Toledo. In his plea agreement to avoid the death penalty, he pled to aggravated murder and aggravated robbery. His first parole board hearing is scheduled for 2047. You know, you see Brandy grow up from being an explorer in the explorer program to being a deputy and getting out on the road on his own. And, you know, the kid was going his dream and it ended tragically for him and he left behind a wife and, and two little kids. And unfortunately, it happens across our country every day, right? Well, Brandy was a hard worker. And he liked to have fun. He was uh, he was always looking for, you know, entertainment. He liked to entertain himself and liked to entertain others. And if you knew his dad, his dad was kind of that way too. Every morning, Rick would come in and he would bring a cup of coffee with him. And he'd sit down and he'd, he'd shoot the crap with everybody, you know, for 10, 15 minutes. And, and we had we had locker rooms downstairs. And, and he goes, well, time to go get my Superman outfit on. And he, he'd go down and come back up in his uniform and, and that kind of reason stayed with me you know for for a while because that's kind of how I felt as, as a as a law enforcement officer you know I, I, I was born and raised here in Marion and you know c- coming in and, and you kind of feel like Superman a little bit and, and you know then what happened with Brandy it, it kind of brought that to a screeching halt as a father I mean he's adored the boys and he was like a little kid with them like one time i left to go to the grocery store and he's sitting there playing play-doh with the boys and i get back like an hour hour and a half later and the boys are off playing in the bedroom playing basketball and brandy's still sitting there with the play-doh and the only thing he made were phallic shaped symbols <laughs> i'm like are you having fun there it's just like the, the table covered in them I'm like, is that the only thing you can make with play-doh yeah he was a kid just like they were like he just loved being a father. You know, Brandy had a heart of gold. He really did. He, he was ornery, but he, he had a heart of gold, and all three of them did. It, it was it was tragic. I mean, it it affected so many lives. It's unbelievable the the ripple effect of something like that, and it's and it's still doing it today. Um, you know, I I liked working with Brandy. I missed him. Um, I had a fair amount of survivor's guilt because, like I said, that probably really should have been my call. Um, Randy was a really good cop. He was trusting, but he, you know he had good he had good street smarts. But I don't know. You know, we all have moments where we let our guard down. Unfortunately, he paid the ultimate price for it. Uh, I, I just wish I'd have been there with him. Yeah, it just you know the, the the tragedy that it was. It really did bring this community together for a common cause, and you know to, to be part of that. Is, is something I'll never forget. Um, I, 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 I wish the reason had never happened, but it, it, it was something that, that did bring this community together uh, in a way that you've never seen before or, or since. The Winfield family, they started serving this community with Brandy's great-grandfather, Walter Malcolm Severns, who served as a deputy for the Marion County Sheriff's Office. 
brandy or his great-grandfather's badge on his coat. There's a picture on our website with Sarah holding Brandy's coat with this badge on it at the funeral. Brandy's father, Rick, followed in his grandfather's footsteps and served the city of Marion as an officer for 36 years before retiring in 2011. He died unexpectedly in 2020 after suffering a heart attack. Corey, Brandy's younger brother, served as an officer until a drunk driver hit him while riding his motorcycle in Marion in 2007. This crash resulted in a broken pelvis, a fractured skull, and a traumatic brain injury that would end Corey's career. While three generations of Winfield law enforcement careers have ended, there is still one more Winfield training to serve this community. Landon Winfield, Brandy's son, who was three at the time he was murdered, is studying to become an officer like his father, like his grandfather, like his uncle, and his great-great-grandfather, continuing the Winfield family tradition of service to this great community of Ohio. The sacrifices made by this family, they're real, they're raw, they're heartbreaking. Their sacrifice and loss is one that never goes away, and it's up to us to make sure we continue to support them and to always remember and honor their fallen hero. Sarah has made it her mission to help other survivor families, working with the National Cops Organization each year, supporting new survivor families and their kids while they navigate through the tragedy of losing their own fallen hero. Blake Hines is with National Cops, short for National Concerns of Police Survivors. The death of her husband, Brandy Winfield, in 2004 has really been involved in a lot of aspects of concerns of police survivors um, at the national level and at the chapter level in the state of Ohio and really just full focus on a lot of different areas. I mean, it, it's been basically from being a part of the communications committee to the national organization, the volunteer committee. She's been a representative for the chapter itself with the Ohio cop in various different positions. She's also helped the FOP, the local FOP, with several different items, whether it be, you know, the college scholarship program that they have that benefit there, getting trade school students basically to be able to receive that benefit. She's assisted with basically Ohio health care benefits for, you know, families there, officers there. She's been involved with not only classes retreats for herself, but she's also attended kids camp for both Tyler and Landon, so both of her sons have attended kids camp and then you know since graduated from kids camp and it's just been i was i've been at both retreats with her personally and to see her not only take it in herself and you know really assist her on her grief and journey but also look out for you know other survivors and when i said look out i'm saying she's seeing the individuals maybe that first year survivor even a returning survivor that's sitting there and really thinking about know their grief process and really just being there for them whether it's a listening ear whether it's you know a, a shoulder to turn on whether it's a happy smile she's always there really for everybody else along with herself so it, it's amazing to see an individual not only attend you know the retreat and get something out of it herself but then also put back into it you know exactly what she's getting out of it for others and really just being that helping hand and that's uh, you know what our organization is all about, you know, is rebuilding Cheddar lives. And, you know, she was provided hope for organization. And then she just basically takes that and helps others, you know, build them, you know, build themselves up and get on that, you know, that grief journey because everybody's different. And that's something that she's very good at acknowledging and being able to, do, you know, just like I said, be that helping hand, be that, you know, ear that you can talk to. And, and she just does a great job of really, seeing those people and just kind of it, it's almost like a sense like she knows when to approach those people or when to you know uh, kind of do well, what I would call is kind of her survivor thing like she knows you know what to do I mean it's it, not only those two programs but seeing her volunteer at National Police Week she's been a volunteer with the registration process there on site and watching her you know meet the individuals that are there the survivors that are there to 
you know, honor their officer and really being able to talk to them and relate to them because she was in their shoes at one point and being able to assist with some of those stress levels that there's going through because it is a big week, a very, you know, stressful and straining week that they're going through to honor their officer and um, make sure they're never forgotten. She does a great job of kind of walking them through some of, you know, some of that kind of stuff. So it's, it's amazing to see, you know, firsthand um, at some of those events that she does. Another event that she's attended is uh, Kalsawa Carpers Ferry, and that's basically a two-day, 25-mile um, jaunt, if you will, of uh, survivors, law enforcement, you know, officers, support staff that come together in kind of a fundraiser-type atmosphere. But at the same time, they're honoring an officer or officers and really bonding, and you see a lot of amazing connections that come through that, and she's been you know, at one of those there at Harper's Ferry. And I think it's so amazing about basically Sarah and just the family story in uh, that local community is that she's doing all these amazing things. And, you know, it's a family that she never wanted to join. But now that she's here, she's fully invested and she's giving back, you know, all that she can, basically in honor of Brandy and, and making sure that, you know, he's never forgotten and, and living that kind of through cops she's been uh, just really broad scope just kind of had her hand in so many different things that has really been able to just assist and support survivors throughout not only her state but at a national level just the reach is just tremendous she's just been such a amazing person that's willing to give back and really do anything she can to help others respond to a survivor that she knows like it's just like the sense that she picks up on that hey this person you know needs some peer support they need a they need an ear and it's just it's just amazing and and through that you know brandy's never going to be forgotten that that goes without being said but it's just it's just amazing to see because that the legacy lives on through what she's doing um, for others Through her work with National Cops, Sarah continues Brandy's legacy, carrying on the long family history of service to their community. Landon will be the next generation, the fourth Winfield generation to carry on that Winfield tradition. If you'd like to find out more about the National Cops organization, you can check out their website at www.concernsofpolicesurvivors.org we'll have a link to their organization in the story notes. Brandy Winfield. He was a hero. And it's not how he died that made him a hero. It's how he lived. He comes from a long line of heroes in that family. A Winfield tradition that we're certain will continue in Ohio. Walking eastbound, walking eastbound. Thank you for spending the time to listen, learn about, and honor the memory of this fallen hero. Make sure you take the time to thank your local law enforcement for their service and their sacrifice. And don't forget to thank their families too. They also sacrifice so much for our safety. It's up to us to help ensure the sacrifices made by these fallen heroes and by their families are never forgotten. So please share this podcast with family and friends. Until next time, this is the Officer Down Memorial Podcast. I'm Scott Rose. Thanks for listening. Thank you.